everyone, I'm Lisa. Hey, welcome to Calvary Community Church this special holiday weekend. I hope your dog is faring better than mine and that you're having a great Independence Day weekend. As our service gets started, we just wanna take a minute to tell you about some things that are most important to us as a church family. If you're new around here, or maybe today is your very first time, a super special welcome to each one of you. Please fill out one of these cards and bring it to the connect table so that we can give you a gift for being here with us today. No strings attached, just some stuff we think you'll like. Here at Calvary, one of the things we're most passionate about is reaching the next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a child grows up knowing that they're loved by God and created by Him for a purpose, it doesn't just change their life, it can impact an entire family. That's the biggest reason we give our kids Summer Spectacular, one week where every night they can come to Calvary and learn about God and how to hold tight to Him. They'll also have a ton of fun with the stories, snacks, games, and, well, each other. Summer Spectacular starts July 18th, so now is the time to register your kids and invite their friends. It's super easy to sign up on the Calvary app or at mycalvary.org, so sign up today. And next week, our Sunday marriage group that meets at 9 a.m. in the Royal Room is kicking off a brand new series. So if you're interested, please come next Sunday. They would love to see you and welcome you. And finally, tonight, yes, this very night, starting at 7.30 p.m., we are hosting a parking lot party at the South End to watch the city fireworks and show our guests who come from our surrounding neighborhoods that they are loved. So bring a lawn chair or blanket and join us for burgers and hot dogs on the lawn, and we'll wait for the show to start. See you tonight. And that's it for now. Hey, remember, you are loved. Thanks for making this a great day at church. And happy 4th! Father, we thank you so much for this privilege that we have to 
live in this country that you've blessed us with. Thank you, God. Thank you for all those who went before us to, to start this land and keep working for this land. God, I pray that we would be your beacons of light here in this land, that we would be your missionaries to America, and that we would be loving people, that we would be spreading your gospel throughout this land, God. And we thank you. In all of its imperfections, it is a great country, and you have blessed us with it. Thank you, God, so much. Um, use us, Lord. Use us to, to be a beacon, uh, a place of hope, a place that, that shows people Jesus Christ. It's in his name we get to pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together this great hymn of the faith and express, <laughs> declare the greatness of God. Lord, you are so great. We are thankful that you meet us in this place.
redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, rewarder. To only a God like you, do I give my praise. Only to you, God. You're the one who is worthy of all of our praise. We are so very thankful for our great and awesome King. Lord, only you, you are worthy. Thank you, God. Amen. <laughs> you were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most
good. Be seated. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming and joining us for worship this morning at Calvary Community Church. We welcome all of those who are watching online as well. Um, we always feel it's a great privilege to have all of you come here and to lift up the name of our great God, especially here on um, the weekend of July 4th. And we just thank you um, for being here. We have a new verse for the month, um, James 4.17. So if you will follow me, we'll have the verse. We'll then repeat the verse and then the reference again. So James 4.17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do, and does not do it, to him it is sin. James 4, 17. We would really love to connect with you, and so if you could do us a favor, there are connect cards in front of you and the seat back in front of you. If you have a prayer request, if you're new here or fairly new here, um, and you've never reached out to us, we would love for you to do that so you can fill out those cards, and you can put them in the black boxes at each of the entrances, or you can stop by our connect tables and if, especially if this is your very first time here, we have a gift for you just to say thank you for choosing Calvary Community Church um, to worship. So if you would do that, we would really appreciate it. Um, we have a great event coming up this evening, and it is our July 3rd picnic. And so we have a new grill. I'm kind of psyched about that. Um, I'll be flipping burgers and turning hot dogs. Um, this is a great, again, a great event for all of us to just to gather and celebrate the 4th of July, but also because there's so many people in our community that come here um, to watch the fireworks. So if you've never been around here, we're going to be down at the south end of the parking lot because there, at 10 o'clock, you will have a, just a great view of the city fireworks tonight at 10. So bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket, um, bring your appetite, and we'll just have a great time this evening. We have another great event coming up here, and that is, look at that, Summer Spectacular, our form of VBS. And we really, really have a great program that Pastor Shane and his team work very, very hard on. And so we, first of all, we love your prayers and just pray that we would be able to fill this place full of young faces um, so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Um, if you have kids and you haven't signed them up, you can do that. You can do it online. You can do it at the app. You can do it at our connect tables. That would be great. We also want you to sign up your neighbor kids, your co-workers kids, your family's kids, whoever, whatever. We want, again, our desire, our prayer is to have a lot of kids in here to have fun, to worship God, but more importantly, to hear the truth, the gospel of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, be praying for that if you want to volunteer. I know Pastor Shane and his team are still looking for folks um, to help during that week as well. All right, you all are just phenomenal when it comes to giving. You're a very generous church. Um, and we appreciate it so much because it gives us, as the body of Christ, an opportunity to share Christ not only with our community but with people around the world. It also gives us the opportunity on a weekly basis um, to help folks that might be struggling. And so we really appreciate it. There's three ways that you can give, and you can see that on the screen as well. Well, we've come to our time of worship where we are going to lift up our prayers and our praises to our great God. So please join me in prayer uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, thank you so much uh, for who you are. Lord, you are our rock. You are our salvation. You are our Savior. And we, Lord, just want to worship you and thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here this morning and bringing us together um, again, Lord, just to make much of your name. And so, Lord, we want to lift up all of those who are dealing with health issues. And in particular, Lord, we, we pray for Mary Lynn and Dreesen and appointments that she has. And Lord, just struggling with hip and back pain and just give her relief from that and doctor's wisdom. Lord, we lift up Debbie Hopkins and all of her health issues. We pray for two-year-old Nash Grimm. Lord, we want to lift up Deborah Conavera, 
Carl Rogers and Sally Shelton, Linda's brother Jim in recovery from his surgery, Travis's uncle who has cancer. We pray, Lord, for healing there, peace, and salvation. We think of Donna Foreman and her surgery on July 11th. We also pray for Tricia Hendricks and the surgery that she also is having on July 11th. Lord, we also want to lift up all those families that are struggling. Um, again, we think of Debbie Hopkins' family, Kirsten's family, Pam's family, and the family of Nate and Tanya's friend, Dale, who just went home to be with the Lord. Lord, we pray for Jason and Lacey's friends, Corey and Ella, and they had a fire this week, Lord, and their beloved friend and, um, and pet dog, Lord, who did not make it through that fire. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are traveling at this time. We lift up Pam's daughter, Jade, who is coming home from Germany. We also lift up Mor um, Maury's son, Matthew, who is deployed. And we ask, Lord, for his safety and quick return. Heavenly Father, we, we do think of all of those who are serving at this time, Lord. Um, and we want to thank them for their service and their sacrifice, especially this weekend, Lord as we celebrate July 4th, as we are standing here, sitting here, worshiping, praying, studying your word, Lord, without fear of persecution. Lord, we thank you for that freedom. Lord, we praise you for the good results that Shannon received at the Mayo Clinic. We praise you, Lord, for Matt and Shannon's 25, 25 years of marriage and Ben's 18th birthday. birthday. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of our family members, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, who do not know you as Savior. Lord, we ask that you would soften their hearts and soften the hearts of David and Bill. We think of all the kids who will be coming to Summer Spectacular. Think of Pastor Shane and his team and all those who are going to be working. We ask, Lord, that you would just fill this room with young faces, um, young kids that we can share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, that lives would be changed. Lord, we love you as we continue to praise. Again, Lord, we want to lift your name up on high. And it's in Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. It's running after, it's running after me. Your 
come through. We are so very thankful that we can trust in you and we can trust in your goodness that you have what's best in mind. Thank you, God. Now as Pastor Steve comes to open your book and preach from your word, God, may you find open hearts in this place. May we respond to whatever you have for us with faithfulness right back to you. God, may we be faithful servants. Change us. Make us more like Jesus. It's in his name we get to pray. Amen. Amen. If you would open your Bibles this morning to James chapter 4. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible or maybe you don't own one, then I invite you to use the Bible that's in the seat in front of you. Turn in the New Testament to page 178. This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, the danger of assumption. In the passage we're going to read today, James warns us not to make assumptions about two specific things. He says, don't assume that you know enough about people to judge them. And don't assume that you know enough about the future to make plans that do not include God. So look with me now at verse 11 of James chapter 4. He says, do not speak against one another. Now, if you have your outlines, jot down this first point. Don't slander people with your tongue. He says, don't speak against one another. Well, that word speak against comes from the Greek word katalalete, and it means to speak evil of, to defame, or slander. This verb occurs three times in verse 11 alone. He says, do not speak against one another. Notice this next word, brethren. Now, if you joined us last week, you may remember that James referred to that local group of believers with a very harsh term. He called them adulterers because they had been unfaithful to God. But even though they had been unfaithful, they were still family. You see, sin cannot sever the ties that binds us to Christ. And when we sin, Christ still loves us. And so we have a responsibility to love our family members, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they do wrong, especially when they do wrong. So now reminding them of these tithes that bind them together in Christ, he commands them 
to stop slandering or speaking ill of one another. Now, when you read the New Testament, this obviously was a big problem. If you would look up at the screen, Paul wrote to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 1, verse 30, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now, look at this list of sins. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. Now, notice these next two. They are gossips. You mean God thinks of gossip in the same way he does murder? Well, yeah, it's sin. Look at this next word, slanderers. Peter wrote about it as well. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he said, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all, here it is, slander like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Now, what Peter is saying here is that a slandering tongue actually inhibits spiritual growth. Now, does that mean that we are to totally refrain from ever having difficult conversations with people and just go around, we just compliment people all the time, whether it's true or not? Of course not. There's a huge difference between slandering someone and speaking the truth to them in love. And here's that difference. Slandering involves speaking hurtfully about somebody without any desire to help them get better. We usually do it behind their back. We think of slander as being making up something that's untrue and spreading lies. But in the biblical context, it can mean much more. It can mean that we also speak the truth about somebody in a way that isn't going to help them change for the better. Now, let's suppose for a moment that you hear something bad about me. Somebody comes to you and says, did you hear what Pastor Steve did the other day when he was at the Husker football game? And so your ears perk up a little bit. He got into a brawl with a Wisconsin fan. Well, let's think of something else because that might actually happen. Okay, let's, let's not go there, all right? How about this one? Somebody comes to you and says, did you hear what Pastor Steve did the other day at Cracker Barrel? He was eating lunch. And that poor girl didn't keep his tea glass filled. And so he got really ugly and rude with her and made her cry. Now, how should you respond to that? Well, according to Jesus in Matthew 18, you need to come and confront me. That's your responsibility. By the way, even if you don't hear a bad report about me, even if I actually offend you, you have that responsibility to come and confront me. So you come to me and you say, Pastor, I heard a bad report about you today. I heard that you got really ugly and rude at Cracker Barrel. Did this happen? Now, I have that responsibility to you as my brother or sister either deny it as false and say no you heard wrong that didn't happen that wasn't true or to say yeah it did happen now if i admit that it happened and I'm not sorry for it well then you have to take a second step you go then and you carefully share it with another brother or sister in christ and then the two of you come back and you confront me with it if i still don't repent well then that becomes a matter for the church and in this church context you call the deacons together and then the deacons and your witnesses confront me. But if we were to follow that process, most of the conflicts that divide us would be quickly resolved. But the sad thing is we don't handle things that way, do we? Instead, we choose to slander each other behind another's back. And James said, don't do that because, let's read on, he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother... So not only should we refrain from slander, we should also refrain from judging one another as well. Now, what does it mean to judge each other? Well, the word judge here is the Greek verb krenon, and it means to criticize, to find fault with, or condemn. It means that we assume to know as much about that person as God does, and therefore we are fit to mete out justice, to right the wrongs in their life. Now look at the next part of verse 11. He expands this. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother 
speaks against the law and judges the law. Because God alone is omniscient, because He alone sees everything about a person, God alone is fit to be judged. We aren't. Now, our responsibility is to preach the gospel, to call people to repentance, to share with them the message of love, mercy, and forgiveness. And if they accept God's truth, then hallelujah. But if they choose to reject it, as many do, we must be careful that we do not set ourselves up as judge. We have to let God do that. Now, as you know, I'm an avid lover of history. I especially love studying the era of the early church, particularly that time period right after the apostles when the church turned the Roman Empire upside down for Jesus. You see, the church made a tremendous impact upon culture. Well, what did they do? Well, they spoke biblical, eternal truth to the evils of their day, but they didn't just curse the darkness. They invited their fellow citizens to come into the light. And since last Friday, when the Supreme Court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade, we have witnessed people acting out sometimes in a very violent manner. Now, in case you didn't know, the Supreme Court did not outlaw abortion, nor did they assess criminal penalties for medical procedures that take care of miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies. I feel the need to say that because... That is circulating widely, and that is not true. What the Supreme Court did was simply kick the issue back to the states so that people can decide about the issue of life. And by the way, that's the right legal decision. Nowhere in the Constitution do you see the right to an abortion. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg acknowledged that, and she was far from being pro-life. But she said that Roe v. Wade was on very shaky legal ground. You don't find it in the Constitution. What you do find in the Constitution, though, is that powers not given to the federal government are enumerated to the states, and it is a state issue. So that's what they did. They kicked it back. Now, some states, thank God, are built upon a culture of life, and they will outlaw abortion, and that is the right decision. That is the moral thing to do. But the downside to this is that some states are going to go the other direction with it. They're going to legalize abortion all the way up to birth. In fact, I predict three states will go even more radical than that, and they'll actually legalize infanticide. One state that I will not name in particular, though it's on the West Coast and it's the largest state in the Union, <laughs> will probably make it where you can abort your kid up until they get their driver's license. And that's how radical they are. But you know, some people are upset that now that babies will have a chance to live. And they're acting out. Charlie Kirk posted on his Instagram account the other day a video of a group of protesters who were kicking a Bible around like a soccer ball. And then they dipped it in human excrement. And I don't know why any civilized person would act that way. I would not treat anybody's text or religious writings that way because civilized people don't behave that way. But when I saw that, I wanted to set myself up as judge. I wanted the thunderbolts from heaven to come down. Oh, we can't do that. Another lady whose baby was due the next day wrote on her stomach, not a human being yet. A picture taken of that and sharing that with your kid on his 16th birthday, that I didn't consider you to be human. You know, the Justice Department has allowed violence to be threatened against our justices without condemnation. Some members of Congress have actually called the third branch of government illegitimate. They're calling for us to do away with the entire judicial branch. And some are calling for the impeachment of justice. Now, I want you to hear me carefully on this. I have never and will never tiptoe around this subject. All this past week, we've had church pastors put out carefully crafted statements because we don't want to offend anybody when it comes to life. But I won't do that because there is no defense for the murder of innocent people. There is no gray area here. And now more than ever is the time for God's people, like the early church, to speak the truth of God and rebuild a culture of life. Now, can you imagine how much better this nation would be if we valued human life in the womb, outside the womb, all the way to the tomb? 
That's God's plan. But we have to be careful, though, because when we see people acting out, and by the way, all they're doing is acting like people act when they don't have Jesus, we need to make sure that we let God be judge and that we proclaim the truth to them in love. Now look at verse 11 again. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judgment. Now, put yourself in Moses' place. Imagine that you're standing before God's presence on Mount Sinai, and God is carving out the Ten Commandments with His own finger, and He hands them to you, and you look at it, and you say, you know, God, these are pretty good, but I think I can come up with something better. Let me help you tweak them a little bit. How do you think that would go over with God? Not too good. But when we go beyond our role in proclaiming the truth and we pass judgment upon other people, that is exactly what we're doing. And that's what Jonah tried to do at Nineveh. Are you familiar with the story of Jonah? Perhaps I'll resurrect that series here in the near future. We'll go through the book of Jonah again. Oh, it's an awesome book. As a Jew, Jonah hated Nineveh. And for pretty good reason. They were horrible people. A violent, murderous culture. And Jonah didn't want to go there. In fact, when God told him, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach that if they don't repent, they're going to be destroyed in 40 days. Jonah said, God, why don't we just skip the preaching part? Because those buzzards deserve it. I mean, go ahead and destroy them, God. No, God said, I want you to go. And Jonah said, I'm not going. So with the help of a big fish, Jonah eventually made it to Nineveh. And he preaches. And what happens? They repent. From the king on down, they're wearing sackcloth and ashes. And then Jonah gets angry. And God says, Dost thou do well to be angry? And Jonah wanted God to destroy it. He wanted to impose his own sense of justice upon them. But God knew their hearts. God saw everything about them. Verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and to destroy. The reason that we don't judge people is because God sees what we can't. God sees deep within the human heart. He reads motives, intentions. And James says, but who are you who judge your neighbor? So when it comes to people, don't assume you know as much about them as God does. You proclaim the truth in love. And if there's judgment to be passed, let God be the one who does it because God will get it right every time. Now, beginning in verse 13, he warns us about a second thing. He said, don't slander with your tongue. Write this down. Don't suppose that you have tomorrow. Verse 13, come now, you who say, he says, stop just a second. I want you to think about what you're saying. Today or tomorrow, we will go to such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. So what he's warning us about here concerns our making assumptions about the future. Only God knows everything about a person. That's why we allow Him to do the judging. God is also the only one who has complete knowledge of the future. So in this case, an ambitious businessman made plans to travel to a certain city, set up shop, stay there for a year, and make a lot of money. Now let me ask you something. What is wrong with that plan? Is it wrong to be ambitious in growing your business? Oh, of course not. The Bible commends hard work and wise stewardship. There's nothing wrong with working hard and enjoying the fruits of hard-earned labor. There's also nothing wrong with planning ahead. But where this becomes sinful is when we don't factor God's will into our plans for tomorrow. You see, we have to include God in our plans for the future because only God knows what the future holds. To make plans for the future without Him is foolish. Look at verse 14. He says, Yet you do not know. I heard it said many years ago that two of the greatest treasures God ever gives to us in this life is the memory of the past and a veil over tomorrow. God allows our mind to be filled with memories of past events so that we can cherish those memories and we can also learn from our bad experiences. But God also keeps a veil over tomorrow. He chooses to keep the future hidden from our eyes. It's not for us to know. James said, Yet you do not know what your life will be like 
tomorrow. See, tomorrow is uncertain. It's unknown. Everything about you could change in an instant. Just like that. He said you were just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Like a puff of smoke which is here and then gone, so is our life. Now, have you ever read the book of Psalms? There are five books of Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament, each one representing a different genre of Hebrew verse. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and a very controversial book known as Song of Solomon. Now, when I was a youth pastor, I'd tell this to high school kids, did you know that there was an entire book of the Bible devoted to sex? And then their attention would perk up. I found that was the quickest way to get high school boys to, to read the Bible, was to let them know there's an entire book in the Old Testament devoted to sex. But David wrote most of the Psalms. Moses wrote one of them, Psalm 90. And in that chapter, he addresses the brevity of human life. Here's what the great lawgiver of Israel had to say about life. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years... Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? Now look at verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Moses said that we can reasonably expect as human beings to live somewhere between 70 and 80 years. Now, if you read the book of Genesis, you'll know that man has not always been limited to such a short lifespan. In the earliest chapters of Genesis, before the flood of Noah, we read about a group of people known as the Antediluvians. They had incredible lifespans. Adam, the first human, lived to be 930 years old. Jared, 962 years old. He was only outdone by Methuselah. The oldest man who ever lived, by the way, he died in the year of the flood, having attained the lifespan of 969 years old. Noah made it to 950. Now, as I contemplated that this week and these incredibly long lifespans, I wonder how old did you have to be before you could claim Social Security benefits back in those days? <laughs> I mean, you think you have, have it hard now. You've got to wait to 65. Imagine if you had to be 900. What would life be like living that long? But shortly after Noah's flood, lifespans became significantly shorter. Abraham, the great man of faith, only lived to be 175. By the time of Moses, he only lived to be 120. And we know that we don't make it nearly that long today. In our time, Hong Kong boasts the highest life expectancy of any place on earth. The average male in Hong Kong can expect to be about 84 years old at death. The average female, 88. So I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something right. Because here in the United States, the average life expectancy of a man is 74 years old, and a woman is 80. If you go around the world in Central Africa, the war-torn countries there, the average man dies at age 51, and women die at age 55. There's a great disparity there. But if you average the human race out as a whole, you will see that what Moses wrote is true. Across the spectrum of humanity, humans can reasonably expect to live between 70 and 80 years. That's why Moses said, teach us to number our days. So let's do that exact same thing this morning. Notice the straight line drawn at the bottom of your outline. On the left-hand side of that line, I want you to write the year of your birth. In my case, it was 1971. That's right, I'm 51 years old. Some of you are wondering, man, what can he do to be 51 years old and look like he's 30? <laughs> now, come see me afterwards, I'll tell you my secret. On the right-hand side of this line, draw a question mark because this is the date of your death. Now, I hate to drop bad news on you on a holiday weekend, ruin your festive mood but death is something that we're all going to have to face writer of Hebrews said it's appointed unto man once to die but after this the judgment the death rate for the human race is still 100% 
three out of three human beings all die. Now, when it comes to my timeline, assuming that I will live to be the average age of an American male, which is 74, that means if I number my days, I've already spent about 69% of my allotted time here on earth. That's humbling. My journey down here is nearly three quarters of the way completed. If I make it to the average age, which is something that my forebears have not done. My father passed away from lung cancer at age 50. He celebrated his 50th birthday and then died the next day on a Friday afternoon behind his desk at his office. My brother-in-law found him when he didn't come home for supper. In 2021, I hit a huge milestone. I turned 50. Would you believe it that the day after I traveled to Georgia for my nephew's wedding, remembering how my dad passed away one day after his 50th birthday? Well, that evening I made it to Atlanta. I walked into my sister's living room and said, I've now outlived dad by three hours. You know, my dad's brother died way earlier at age 34. He was a victim of alcoholism. All of my uncles passed away before they were 70. I do have one uncle left on my mother's side who is 88, and he is so full of life that he just got remarried two weeks ago. <laughs> uncle Hubert never drank or smoked a day in his life, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Now, as I look back on the course of my life, I have to wonder where it's all gone. And here's the reality. I have more days behind me than I have in front of me. So let's go back to our timeline. We don't control the day of our birth, nor the circumstances into which we were born. Almighty God in His providence determined that long before time began. And in His divine providence, He determined that I would be born on March the 2nd, 1971 to Roy and Patricia Davenport in Atlanta, Georgia. I had no say in that whatsoever. But you know, I often do feel like a man out of time. I feel like I belong to another era. Now, if God would have included me in on the planning of my life, I would have chosen to have been born somewhere near the end of World War I and been part of the greatest generation. I mean, who wouldn't want to be part of that generation? Amen? My values seem more closely aligned with that time period than now, but God didn't do that. He placed me right here, right now, for a reason. And likewise, He's also determined when and how I will leave this world. It may be that Jesus will return, and I'll be raptured out of here in the twinkling of an eye and never see death. But if that doesn't happen, my destiny is the grave. That is beyond my control. But what little we do control lies in the middle of those two fixed points on the line. I do have a say what happens there. And day by day, I write the story of my life one choice at a time. You know, I, I love J.R.R. Tolkien. Have you ever read his books, Lord of the Rings? Most of you have probably seen the movies. You haven't read the books. And I'll say this. I think those movies are the greatest movies ever made. There's so much biblical truth contained in them. Look up at this video on the screen I want to share with you. The Fellowship is in the mines of Moria, an evil, dark place where they're about to encounter a dreadful evil, a demon named Balrog. And in this gloomy underground cavern, little Frodo is expressing to Gandalf how he wished the circumstances of his life were different, how he wished the ring had never come to him. Let's listen to their conversation. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. Did you hear what he said? All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I do not know when my time will be up. All I know is that I have right now, and I better make it count. 
Here's how James says we should feel about tomorrow. Look at verse 15. Instead, here's a better way. You ought to say, if the Lord wills. You see, the secret is the will of God. We don't presume that our life is ours to do with as we please. We don't allow selfish ambition to drive us to make plans for the future without first checking with God. Because the secret to happiness in life is not found in doing what you want. It's found in doing what God wants. James said, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. You see, assuming upon tomorrow is prideful. It's a display of arrogance. And Jesus told the story about a man who did this exact thing. In Luke's gospel, he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. You see, he's presuming upon tomorrow. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Are you like this guy? Have you included God in your plans for the future? James said, all such boasting is evil. Now, if I can, I want young people to listen up. Let me speak to those of you whose journey is just getting started. Those of you who have way more days in front of you than you have behind you. The wisest thing that you can ever do is determine why you're on this earth. <clears throat> you were created for a purpose. Placed carefully into this space and time by your all-knowing creator who fashioned every intricate part of you in your mother's womb. Look in the mirror and all those things that are uniquely you were given to you by your loving heavenly father. You're no accident. You aren't the product of random chance and evolution over billions of years. You aren't even a highly developed mammal as they tell you. You're so much more. You see, unlike any animal on planet Earth, you bear the imago Dei, or the image of God Himself. And that God has placed you here for a reason. See, when I was 12 years old, I discovered my purpose. I've never doubted it. I knew from an early age that God wanted me to do exactly what I'm doing right now, and I have been blessed in so many ways. In fact, I hope it doesn't happen, but if I were to die this weekend... I've had a wonderful, blessed life. But here's my advice to you. Don't follow your dreams. Don't follow your passions. That's what the world tells you. Your dreams may quickly become nightmares. Your selfish passions will destroy you. Here's a better way. Follow God. You know, the wisest man who ever lived was King Solomon. He said this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You see, if you leave your future in the hands of God, then you will live your days on this earth with very few regrets. In one of those poetic books Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He said, this is what life is all about. Two things, fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now look at verse 17 as we close. This is our memory verse for the month of July. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do. In this passage, he's told us two things, two right things to do. Number one, don't slander people with your tongue. Don't live that way. It's sinful. And don't make assumptions about tomorrow. If you have plans about the future, you make sure you run them by God. You make sure your future involves doing the will of God. He says, if you know the right thing to do and don't do it, to him it is sin. This life is a gift from God above. 
use it wisely let's pray heavenly father we thank you today for this independence day and god as your people we look to a greater freedom than can be guaranteed by our constitution god we look to the freedom that we can have in christ jesus lord that he can grant us liberty from the bondage of sin that leads to death thank you lord that because of jesus christ and his liberating gospel Lord, that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we're your children. And God, I pray today if there's someone in this room and they do not know you as their Savior, God, I pray that today, Lord, the truth of your Son, Lord, would pierce their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for worshiping with us today. Don't forget that tonight we have our parking lot party at 730, and uh, we will have hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks and they will be coming off a brand new grill. <laughs> Scott has a new toy to play with, and uh, we're thankful for that. And we invite you to come tonight and enjoy the fellowship, not only of, of our church family, but also of the community. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. May the Lord bless you and have a safe and happy 4th of July. Come on, everybody, listen. Yeah! Amen.